Okay, I'll be giving the next presentation on the measurement of tinnitus. So first of all, why even measure tinnitus? Why can you consider it? And there's actually probably four reasons for this. One is it's often uh, informative and comforting for the patient. Two, it can help us as clinicians, perhaps guide uh, directions and quantify effects. It is essential, of course, for doing research to be able to quantify whatever it is you're trying to change. And um, also, it's very helpful in legal cases in some situations as well, as many people, unfortunately, still receive tinnitus and hyperacusis when they're exposed to loud noise at work, uh, head injuries and car accidents, and other instances as well. So sometimes when the patients come in, some of them are very worried about their mental status because they're now hearing sound in their head that they have no idea where it comes from. And being able to measure it is often very um, comforting for them. I know sometimes when we talk about this to patients, they say, wow, you mean you can actually measure my tinnitus? And that's a wonderful thing for the patient because they appreciate that it is real and that you understand that. Um, Sometimes people use uh, evoke potentials and uh, autoacoustic emissions and even the audiogram to demonstrate that the patient does indeed have a hearing loss, even though they do not think they have a hearing loss. And sometimes that demonstration of a hearing loss, whatever tool you're using, is also a comforting factor because now you can actually point to something and say, yes, indeed, here it is. There is evidence and your hearing system is not the way it was when you were 18 years old. Um, so uh, keep that in mind as the potential opportunity for interacting with the patient and showing them that they indeed do have something uh, abnormal with their hearing. For the clinician, measuring tinnitus can be helpful in uh, patient management, trying to determine which areas uh, need attention, how severe they have, um, if treatment is even needed or perhaps not. Um, also, measuring tools can help determine which aspects of counseling may be needed or not needed, and we'll talk about that later in the context of tinnitus activities treatment. Um, also, as a clinician, you'd like to know, and the patient would like to know, if they feel like things have changed, that things are getting better for them, and by quantifying it, you can demonstrate that. Um, in some situations, the measurements uh, are helpful in actually fitting devices. Um, I've seen uh, research suggesting it is, suggesting it's not. I don't really have a strong opinion at this point, but clearly there are some therapies of which you're going to hear some more about tomorrow that um, uh, part of the therapy depends upon some of the measurements that are made in terms of the noise spectra, the level of the tinnitus, the uh, internal uh, spectrum. Um, sometimes it's important, for example, if you can demonstrate that masking on one ear has an effect on tinnitus in both ears. Um, there are some patients that come in in the morning and say, uh, or say that they've used the device in the morning for several hours and their tinnitus is gone for several hours afterwards. So sometimes it's helpful to actually quantify this post-masking effect and see if that could be built into a therapeutic approach as well. So in measuring tinnitus, um, it's important to think about the big picture here, first of all. And so if you think about tinnitus as a sound, it has some external internal representation, a pitch and a loudness, your ability to mask it. Um, and then again, to consider there's actually the tinnitus and the reactions. So the reactions to the tinnitus, we believe the primary reactions people have are emotions, hearing, sleep, and concentration. Not everybody has problems sleeping, for example, with their tinnitus. In addition to that, it's already been mentioned about what about the overall psychology of the patient, and that might include whether somebody has a tendency to be upset by things or whether they're already clinically depressed when they get tinnitus. So sometimes it's important to get a perspective of where the patient is at as well. And again, we note this psychological model that we introduced about trying to be clear that um, you have your tinnitus and you have your reactions and the ultimate annoyance. And the, the amount that you're involved with the, the, these uh, 
degree that you're affected by your tinnitus has, is influenced by your psychological makeup. So if you lost your job last week or you're, there's some other stress going on in your family, then you're more likely to be, have a strong reaction to your tinnitus. Um, and so this is important to keep those two factors uh, in line. Um, if you do correlations across lots of patients between, for example, the loudness of tinnitus and the annoyance or the overall um, distress caused by tinnitus, sometimes the correlations across uh, many subjects are not statistically significant. And some people, I've heard many people say that this implies that the loudness of tinnitus is not that important. And I think that's wrong. I think the loudness is important, but it's only one characteristic. So uh, as I said, the, the, uh, your individual psychological makeup for the patient also has a role to play. But in general, we do know from lots of studies that within an individual, louder sounds are usually more annoying. Now, we've already seen that several people here have tinnitus. If you would prefer your tinnitus to be louder, please raise your hand. <laughs> so that doesn't happen. So in fact, indeed, a louder tinnitus is generally more distressing. Again, we all have different, uh, different um, levels of magnitude of what is distressing and what's not. But clearly, um, the loudness and the pitch, these things all play a factor. So if you're designing a treatment for tinnitus itself, then you should be measuring the magnitude of the tinnitus, maybe even the pitch characteristics. You should be measuring the loudness. And one easy way that um, I learned as a student was that the minimum masking level, or the amount of noise to measure a tone, is incredibly reliable and accurate and representative of the level of the tone in normal listeners. So it was obvious to use this technique as an attempt to quantify the internal magnitude of tinnitus. If you're treating the reactions to the tinnitus, then you should measure those reactions. You should measure those, uh, the annoyance caused. Um, there will be primary reactions, um, like getting to sleep at night, or and there will be secondary reactions, like how it affects your work. But if you're, uh, if you're using a drug to make the tinnitus go away, you should be measuring the tinnitus, the internal tinnitus. If you're using counseling, or sound therapy to try and help the people, the person cope with their tinnitus, which is just fine. You should be measuring their reactions to their tinnitus. And it's important to keep those two things separate. For any measurement, no matter what it is, it needs to be valid, reliable, and have sufficient resolution so you can actually measure a change. And I think sometimes we forget this. And uh, people have propo proposed all kinds of different things, including objective measures, and some of those can be very helpful. But it's important that they actually be valid, that they are measuring the, the thing that we want to measure. And that's, again, true for every measure. And just because it's an objective measure doesn't inherently mean it's a better, me better measure than a subjective measure. The critical issue is that all these measurements have to be valid, reliable, and have sufficient resolution to quantify what we're interested in measuring. This is quite complicated somewhat for tinnitus because usually all measurements, including when we measure an audiogram, there's procedural measurements uh, uh, variability. Well, patients with tinnitus also often report that their tinnitus changes from day to day or throughout the day. In addition to that, some patients will say that the tone or the noise that you use actually changes their tinnitus. So that's a real challenge in measuring tinnitus in individuals. So to keep that in mind in the kinds of measurements that you're doing in the procedures and stimuli that you use. So for each patient, it's helpful to establish the variability for that individual patient, depending upon what you're interested in, and also the source of variability if that's possible. So pitch is one that's been used for a long time. And in normal listeners, we tend to think, generally speaking, of place pitch. The place, for example, on the uh, basilar membrane uh, that is mostly active. But also, there's something we call the periodicity pitch, or pitch related to the timing of the waveform of an acoustic stimulus. Um, so we 
generally from normal listeners, we, we have a pretty good relationship between these, the physical stimulus and the subjective uh, perception of pitch for all kinds of acoustic stimuli, including those that vary in their envelope and waveform and noise spectra. So in measuring pitch in a tinnitus patient, it's certainly important to document and understand this fun uh, fundamental property. And it may also be a clue to the internal representation of the tinnitus. Now keep in mind it could be related to the spectral content or the timing content of that internal signal, so it's not completely clear in those two opportunities here. So uh, if we look at the audiogram, that might point us in some directions of what the mechanism is of the tinnitus. For example, um, the pitch has been shown to be related in some patients at the low frequency edge of an audiogram, as uh, I mentioned earlier in one of the models of tinnitus. Uh, I've also seen a study done in England many, many years ago where a drug had reduced the tinnitus in some patients, reduced the magnitude of the tinnitus in some patients, and at the same time reduced the pitch match frequency, as if it was actually slowing down perhaps the spontaneous activity. Pitch matching might also be important in fitting devices. Um, you might want to look at the noise spectra to use that. So we did some experiments, and I'll talk about that to uh, perhaps find out what kind of spectra you should be using to uh, mask the tinnitus, or to uh, find the placement of a notch, if you're using a notch signal to try and affect the tinnitus. And we'll hear more about that tomorrow. We talk about the most prominent pitch. So even though their tinnitus might sound like a noise or a cricket or a hum, most patients will also come out with some ability to note what the most prominent pitch is, no matter what it sounds like. But it is a complicated for some patients, even normal patients matching a pure tone or a narrow band of noise. It can be highly variable. So because of that, we would suggest you keep, it, keep the method simple so it's easy for the subject to replicate. And I would also argue that um, you always want to use monaural stimuli unless you're actually interested in um, testing the binaural auditory system in some way. So um, then that approves, that's applicable to all the tinnitus tests, not just the pitch. So um, this is some uh, data from Mary Meikle and Jack Vernon from many years ago, where they just studied many subjects and looked at their pitch match frequency. And most of the pitch match frequency was in the region of four to 6,000, 8,000 hertz. Um, we noted that sometimes in our early work that sometimes the pitch match was related to a, a hearing loss and sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes it was on a low frequency edge, sometimes a high frequency edge. So it wasn't really related in any clear way to the audiometric shape. Um, there ha has been much more interest in this in recent years, uh, particularly because of some of the theories that have been mentioned, but also because some of the new treatments that are coming out. So it may very well be that in some patients there is a relationship between the pitch match frequency and the audiogram and perhaps the person's internal cause and function of their tinnitus. So it's important to look at these things individually. Because of the importance of this, we looked at this um, quite systematically um, uh, because of this theoretical issues. So um, this is done, uh, we had patients um, who reported their tinnitus with cricket-like, noise, uh, tonal, and some others. And these are their individual audiograms, and these are their average audiograms. They were pretty similar, even though they had different descriptors for their tinnitus. And this is the pitch match frequency. So those patients who reported they had tonal tinnitus, they were much more likely to have a high frequency pitch match. The other ones, not so much so. Um, we also asked them, we compared the patients who had low frequency pitches, mid frequency, and high and very high frequencies. And again, their audiograms were the same in spite of the tinnitus pitch match frequency. And these are the actual individual pitch match frequencies in the groups. We also looked at the audiogram shape, which is perhaps more important for the issue here. So we came up with uh, four different, or several different shapes here uh, normal, uh, flat, gradual, steep slope, low frequency loss, a notch, and inverted U. 
And these are the patients that fell into each of those groups. And these are the audiograms, the average audiograms from each of the groups. And then the uh, corresponding pitch match frequencies to each of the groups. And again, we were not able to document that any particular group or any particular shape had a predominant pitch match frequency in any particular region. So we showed no clear correlation between the pitch match frequency and the shape in most patients. Um, just to show some individual uh, results here, these are three different patients, noise, cricket, and tonal tinnitus. This is the audiogram here. This is the most prominent pitch match frequency with this subject. This is a patient who reported a cricket-like tinnitus, and their pitch match frequency was right here at the edge, the low frequency edge. This patient had a notch, likely noise exposure, and their pitch match frequency was higher than the notch of the noise. So again, this emphasizes the differences across individuals. <coughs> so the internal spectrum of a patient's, with normal listeners, we think of this internal spectrum as uh, uh, corresponding to uh, a pure tone on the, on the traveling wave, on the basal membrane, and we're gonna try and mask it to try and find out um, how, what region that tone or that noise uh, excites. And so we performed uh, early on some different uh, experiments to try and quantify the internal spectrum. Um, more recently, Narina has used an attempt where uh, he presents peer tones and asks patients to relate the similarity of the sensations to the tinnitus. Um, I don't think this is a good idea because uh, I don't know how to compare this to studies from normal listeners. The similarity could be based on pitch matching or it could be based on the, the spectrum of the signal, and I don't really know how that relates to the internal spectrum the way that I look at it for the tinnitus. So uh, pitch matching should be to the most prominent pitch match of the tinnitus. It can be highly variable in uh, normal listeners as well as patients with tinnitus. And in most patients, at least, it's not related to the audiogram shape. Loudness. Uh, loudness should be a good estimate of the internal magnitude of the tinnitus. And there's two ways of trying to get at this. One is with a loudness matching procedure. So I want you to adjust my tone so it has the same loudness as your tinnitus. So um, again, we're, I'm interested in individual results, but it's the level of my tone. So I can measure the sound pressure level of my tone, and you're gonna make that equal to the loudness of your tinnitus. We can also use loudness magnitude estimation, excuse me, so we can ask patients to actually rate the loudness of your tinnitus on a scale from zero to 100, where zero is the quietest sound you can imagine, and 100 is the loudest sound you can imagine. And here's an example of things we've done here to try and quantify that in several studies. With the loudest matching, you can use different methods, a method of limits and adjustments, so that's where you're gonna adjust the level of my tone so it equals to your tinnitus. Um, and there's no one right approach to this um, it depends on the equipment that you're working with, for example, just a standard clinical audiometer or a particular system for measuring tinnitus and maybe also the patient's familiarity and estimating. So again, the, the um, strategy is pretty clear. A adjust the level of my tone so it has the same loudness of your tinnitus, and this could be done in the ipsilateral ear with monaural stimuli. The disadvantage of that is you might change the tinnitus in the same ear, but the advantage of that is you don't have to worry about loudness growth and loudness recruitment in two different ears being different. So these are again data from Vernon and Meikle, and they showed that the loudness match of these patients is often, um, is often quite uh, low, three or four or five dB sensation level. Now, I say this uh, with some caution. This is the loudness match in dB sensation level. And the loudness match is not a measurement of loudness. So the sensation level could be small, but the sensation level is not a measure of loudness. The sensation level is a measure of the level of a tone above threshold. So we did an experiment where we measured several patients and did their, measured their audiograms and sound pressure levels. So this is normal zero dBHL 
in sound pressure level. This is the individual's audiogram. This is their pitch match frequency. We asked them to adjust the level of the tone so it was equal to their loudness at the pitch match frequency, shown with this square, and we also asked it to do it in a low frequency region with more normal hearing. So it was only three or four dB to be above threshold at 8,000 hertz and 30 dB above threshold at 500 hertz. Is this wrong? What's going on here? I'll also note in this subject, and I'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow, that we also noticed some subjects had very low loudness discomfort levels. This is normal loudness discomfort level up here. And this was the first time anybody drew, drew a link between hyperacusis, loudness hyperacusis, and tinnitus. So this is a relation, an arbitrary scale but between the stimulus level and the loudness. So A represents normal hearing. So that's the relationship between the intensity of a sound and the loudness rating. If you have a sensory neural hearing loss, and let's say a 40 dB hearing loss, and you have loudness recruitment, your maximum loudness level is up here at the very same level. If you have loudness recruitment and, or I should better say, uh, loudness hyperacusis, your threshold might be down here somewhere, but your loudness discomfort level is at a much lower stimulus level than normal listeners or listeners with um, loudness recruitment. So this was an important step. And so then we want to know, well, how do we, how do we quantify somebody's loudness, tinnitus loudness, if they have recruitment or if they have hyperacusis? And this formula up here was an international standard representing the level of a signal in normal listeners to its loudness in zones. So one zone is uh, half as loud as two zones, and there's an international standard uh, documenting the relationship between a thousand hertz peer tone and uh, one zone at 40 dB, I believe, HL. So this was an international standard for normal listeners, and we adopted this and proposed it so people could convert loudness matches and sensation level to loudness in zones. Um, so that was a proposal many years ago. So annoyance. In general, the louder a sound is more annoying, and this is true for normal listeners and patients with tinnitus. But people have different degrees of uh, definitions of what loudness and what annoyance is, so you have to keep that in mind. So it is important, I believe, to measure the loudness of tinnitus. You've got two ways of doing this, depending upon what you're interested in. Keep in mind that just because somebody's sensation level measurement is only a few dB above threshold, it does not mean their tinnitus is not loud. And indeed, louder sounds are generally more annoying for tinnitus patients and for all of us. <coughs> Minimum masking level, the amount of noise required to mask the tinnitus. Um, and the greater the noise level, the greater the um, internal magnitude of the tinnitus. So typically, we would use a broadband noise. We would increase the level until the patient said it just masked their tinnitus. The problem with this procedure, although it's very, very, very accurate for some people and very re reproducible, the problem is in some tinnitus patients, you cannot mask their tinnitus. So these people are quite different. There's a, a great example of a different subtype of tinnitus patients. We use the level, adjust the level of my noise until it just masks your tinnitus. Lots of different psychophysical procedures could be used. Um, there might be some situations, like if you're trying to explore whether binaural maskers are better, requiring less level, you would use binaural stimulus. And you can test this in either ear. Um, we tried to some of this in uh, documenting what, we, what was called partial masking in the psychophysical literature and looking at different levels uh, of providing relief for sound therapy devices. And um, we'll talk about those uh, in the next section a little bit more on devices. Um, so for binaural masking, we did a study where we put some noise in, um, in the right ear. We put the noise of the exact same waveform in the left ear. So it's the same noise going to both ears. 
and we contrasted that to one noise going to one ear and a totally different waveform of noise going to the other ear, in which case you hear it throughout your head. And we then tried to compare this uncorrelated noise to binaural noise that was correlated. It turns out that if you delay the waveform going to one ear, especially if it's a low frequency emphasis noise, you can change the location of that noise throughout your head. And we thought that maybe we could use less uh, masking noise if you could move the noise over the region of the person's uh, internal representation of their tinnitus. Um, because some people said they heard their tinnitus in their head, for example. So this didn't work out that well, but there were at least two or possibly three patients who the time-delayed noise often resulted, in, the, in this case, 20 dB less masking noise to suppress the tinnitus than if it was just the same noise level but, uh, but uh, uncorrelated. So this is an enormous amount of change. The frequency-dependent masking, um, my advisor Arnold Small had did the first psychoacoustical tuning curves using pure tones to mask uh, a continuous signal, pure tone, in a normal listeners, and we applied this to um, tinnitus patients, and uh, the results are shown here. So this is a summary of the average results. This is a group that had, normal, that had a high-frequency hearing loss, their pitch match frequency was here. For some subjects, they could mask the tinnitus at any level, but just a few dB above threshold. For other subjects, it took high sound pressure level signals, uh, these are different pure tones, to mask their tinnitus no matter what the frequency was. For other patients, we could not mask their tinnitus no matter what. And for a fourth group of patients, there was actually some frequency-dependent masking. So this might be related to the same kind of tuning curves in normal listeners. Maybe this person's tinnitus or originates on the basilar membrane in a particular spot, and that's why you can mask it more easily when the frequency of the maskers is close to those patients or not. We don't really know that, but that's a reasonable hypothesis. Several people have also done post-masking experiments, and this has some uh, potential application for uh, clinical devices as well. So you turn the masker on for 10, for, uh, at a certain level, and then turn it off and see what happens. So this is a summary of the results. So that we have the person rate their tinnitus loudness, we turn a masker on to cover up their tinnitus, turn the masker off, and for some patients, the tinnitus is right back where it was. For other patients, when you turn the masker off, the tinnitus is gone. And for sometimes it's gone for five seconds, and for sometimes it's gone for five hours. For other patients, it reduced. For other patients, it came back gradually. And for one or two patients, the tinnitus got worse, in which case we called the hospital attorney right away. <laughs> and fortunately, it did come back eventually to its pre-masker levels. Um, so uh, a variety of different ways, and uh, Jack and Mary had done some of this as well and tried to d document the number of uh, perceptions of different ways. Our experience was from our studies that the, the group that, that ended up depended on the level and the duration of the masker. And so you could move somebody from this group to this group if you made the masker of longer duration. So in, uh, it's also true that for some patients, the masking level doesn't, uh, doesn't stay the same. Um, and I'll just show you the results. This was from uh, Lynn Penner, who was a psychoacoustician doing work, early work on tinnitus. And she would take the patient into the booth and say, OK, I'm going to mask your tinnitus. Tell me um, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's gone. And, the, and she'd set the level and go out of the booth and the patient would say, oh, I hear my tinnitus again. And Lynn would go in and re-instruct the patient and said, look, we, we need to set this at your, at your masking level, and we're going to leave it there for a while. And she went out of the booth and the, was set up, and the patient said, oh, I can hear it again. Lynn went in and shook the patient, pay attention, pay attention. No, she didn't do that. But she did notice that there was something happening. And what was happening was that although the mass threshold for the tinnitus had been discovered, when the noise was left on, continuously, for some patients, the tinnitus came back 
gradually, sometimes over several minutes. And we've noticed this also in looking at some of our cochlear implant patients, that there's some really long-term effects there here that have to be taken into consideration. So there are several questionnaires. Uh, one of the ones that we find very helpful clinically is an open-ended questionnaire. Please make a list of the difficulties that you have as a result of your tinnitus. When we come up with questionnaires, we think, oh, this is great. Our questionnaire is answering all the problems. But sometimes we don't always understand where the patient's at. And so this allows the patient to make a list of what's important for them. And that can be very helpful. So this can be done in the clinic or when the patients, before they come into the clinic, to sort of put them in the perspective. There are several questionnaires that have been developed over many years. Um, we published a paper showing how insensitive the, tearing, the tinnitus handicap inventory was because it scored uh, yes, sometimes, and no, so on a uh, three-label category scale. So it's hard to quantify differences on individual questions, and we've suggested that this not be used uh, for a number of years. We developed the tinnitus handicap questionnaires here in Iowa City many, many years ago. Uh, this is used worldwide and has been translated into many different languages um, and uh, has been used in several clinical trials um, and evaluated independently by several people as well. Uh, these are some of the studies that has been used and some of the ones mentioned by uh, Claudia and some other work we've done and other people have worked in psychoacoustics as well. Um, so we think this is a, remains to be a very good, valid, and sensitive questionnaire. A new questionnaire was developed in 2012, or published in 2012, called the Tinnitus Functional Index. Um, it's scored on a level from 0 to 10, and there are eight factors. It emphasizes over the past week, which Jennifer brought up. I don't like this questionnaire because it includes four questions on the quality of life, and I think that makes it less sensitive to uh, potential impact of the tinnitus. There's something bad happening in your life. Even if your tinnitus has gone down, it may not show up on the questions related to the quality of life. So I think this is a bad questionnaire. Um, so here's a general question. Do you feel in control in regard to your tinnitus? Or how much do you feel your tinnitus has interfered with your enjoyment of social activities or your relationships with family, friends, and other people? So again, I think that your social relationships may be good or bad. They may be really bad. And even though your tinnitus has gotten better, those social relationships may still be a challenge for you. So I suggest not using the tinnitus functional index. Over the years, we've been working on the tinnitus primary functions questionnaire. Uh, it has four categories, the thoughts and emotions, hearing, sleep, and concentration. The short version has three questions per area. We've also published some work where if someone doesn't have any problems sleeping and you're using questions to do with sleep, then that's going to make that particular question in any questionnaire less sensitive to treatment effects. So I, I don't think anybody likes this that's been involved in psychometrics for a while, but it seems to me that if a priori you say if someone doesn't have any problems with sleep or doesn't have any problems with concentration, we're going to exclude those from the pre-post evaluation. Um, so uh, this is the way that we look at this. You have tinnitus. These are the functions impaired. Uh, and these are the, uh, according to the World Health Activ Organizations, the subsequent activity limitations that can be imposed on having tinnitus. Some questions from the tinnitus primary functionnaire, functions questionnaire include, I have difficulty focusing my attention on some important task because of tinnitus. I lie awake at night because of my tinnitus. So there's questions in each of those four categories. This is a pre and post treatment uh, preliminary study we did on some tinnitus activities treatment work, I believe. And these are the scores before and after in each of the different subcategories. So we're able to look carefully at each of the subcategories as well as the total scores. So open-ended questionnaires are valuable for helpful. Um, we use the tinnitus primary function questionnaire both to plan treatment and in clinical trials. 
So tinnitus can be measured. It is often very useful clinically. Not always. We do not always use our questionnaires in all clinical applications. In some, we do. Uh, it can be very helpful to measure pitch, loudness, and masking. Again, not in every clinical situation, but it's certainly in some. And we recommend the tinnitus primary functions questionnaire for clinical trials and for work in the clinic to try and explore what areas you'd like to focus on in your treatment. <clears throat> 